Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, we're doing a message called Dropped Everything. Last week, Nick got to, uh, got to have coffee with Jesus over here. He got to have the, the DTR talk. You know what that is? The define the relationship. Tough one. I'll tell you what, imagine to have that talk with Jesus. Define your relationship with him. Nick got to pull out his keys, and each one of those keys represented a part of his his life and Jesus told him I want every one of those keys you got to hand them all over to me if you want to be a true follower of me he also asked the question what does it mean to be serious about following Jesus it got me thinking about this book called the cost of discipleship it's by Dietrich Bonhoeffer I don't know if you know who he is but he was a, uh, a German pastor and a theologian. He was also a, uh, a, a spy and an anti-Nazi descendant. He, uh, he was a founding member of the Confessing Church, one of the only churches in, in Germany that was openly against the Nazi regime. And because of that, he was imprisoned. In 1943, he was imprisoned for speaking about Hitler's persecution of the Jews and refusing to join the military. Hitler ends up having him, has him uh, executed. When he has him executed, it's done in a Flossenburg concentration camp. Thing is, it was done two weeks prior to the end of World War II. It's almost over. And it's a shame, but in this book, he coined the term cheap grace. It got me thinking about this. So I went and got the book out, and I researched it. I want to find out what he meant about this cheap grace. He says it'll be the mortal enemy of the church. He says cheap grace is grace without a price. Grace without cost. Preaching forgiveness without repentance. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Bonhoeffer goes on, and he contrasts cheap grace with costly grace. He says, costly grace is a hidden treasure. People go and sell all they have to purchase the land that the treasure is hidden on. He also goes on and says, the pearl of great price. The merchant sells all, all that he has to purchase that pearl. The kingdom of God is is the great treasure. Let me say that again. The kingdom of God is the great treasure. The call of Jesus Christ, which causes disciples to leave their nets and follow him. So it gets me thinking about these disciples, guys, the first ones he called. What caused them to drop their nets? So we're going to go to our Bibles now, and I hope you have them with you. If not, it'll be up on the up on the screen or on your tablet or where. We're going to go to Matthew 4, and I'm going to read 18 through 22, and then we're going to go to Matthew 9 and 9, 9. And I'm going to go straight through onto these here. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew 4, 18. And as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting their net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called. And immediately, they left their boat 
and their father and followed him. Now we're going to go to Matthew 9, 9. Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax, tax collector's booth. He says, follow me. He told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. We are going to focus on just one verse out of all that. Verse 19. When Jesus calls, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Disciples come from all backgrounds. Jesus picked disciples from all different lifestyles, occupations, regardless of where they grew up, what life they lived, how much money they had, or what terrible sin they might have committed. Jesus calls, you become one of his disciples. Doesn't matter if you slept with 100 people. Doesn't matter if you lived a homosexual life. It doesn't mean, doesn't matter if you're an addiction to drugs or whatever. Doesn't matter if you killed somebody. When Jesus calls you to be his disciple, no matter what, you leave your old life behind. And you follow him as your Lord and Savior. You become transformed like his likeness. And he wants us to go make more disciples. That's what that whole verse is all about. How does he make disciples? Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In this one command, Jesus gives us four steps to make Christian disciples. So we're gonna look at step one. First, Jesus calls his new disciples. And they dropped everything. So verse 19 says, Jesus called. These fishermen didn't go looking for Jesus. He came looking for them. He found his disciples along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he sees them, and he calls them. And then he sees Matthew at a tax collector. He's entering the city, and there he is at the tax collector booth, and he calls him. To be them, you had to believe in him. So they had to know something about Jesus. They must have seen him or heard about him through the grapevine or something like that, that they believed in him. To believe in him, you got to be born again. You got to give your life to Christ. In John 3, 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How do you know you're born again? Well, first you got to be able to repent your sins and give it all to him. His disciples had to leave their past. I'm going to go to John 4, 13, 14. I got a lot of scripture this morning, folks. <laughs> all right, John 14. Make sure I got the right one here so I don't read the wrong thing. All righty. John 4, 13, and 14. Oh, sorry, lost my page again. I skipped pages on me. Sorry, just bear with me. <laughs> All right. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welled up in eternal life. He's telling you to give away your own thirst and take on his thirst. Get into his word. Know more about him. What did these fishermen do? When Jesus called Simon named Peter and Andrew at once, they left their nets. James and John, immediately, they left their boat that their father was in and gave up their life of fishermen to go follow Jesus. Matthew got up and followed him too from his tax collector booth. What did these disciples actually give up? Simon and his brother Andrew and James, and the son of Zebedee and his brother John, 
gave up a life of being fishermen. A fisherman back in those days was basically somebody who didn't have a really great education, who couldn't find a great job. And that was usually one of the lowest jobs you get was going out on a boat and catching fish. They had to give all that up to follow Jesus. Jude his, and his younger brother, James, they pushed aside their intense, violent, nationalist views to follow Jesus. Matthew left his lucrative, uh, his life as a tax collector to follow Jesus. Bartholomew is most likely a farmer. We don't know a whole lot about what he did, but he had to give up his family business to go follow Jesus. Philip, like another fisherman, he, uh, he dropped his net also to follow Jesus. Simon the Zealot, he had to leave his Zealot views and hatred for everything Roman. He did not like the Romans at all, but he had to give it all up to follow Jesus. Thomas, he had to give up his pessimistic views and follow Jesus. So I look at this, these, these uh, ragtop group, as I look at it, five fishermen, one farmer, one tax collector, two nationalists, one zealot, and one pessimist made up a group of the first guys that Jesus called. He took them and he spent most of four years transforming them after he called them and sending them out to be disciples. So he had to work with these guys for four years to get them to where he wanted them to go to be able to send them out to transform so, how do you know that you are called to be a disciple? When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you confessed all your sins to him, you were called to be a disciple. That was it. So, we're going to go to point one now. Point one is Jesus leads his disciples. Verse 19 says, follow me. Fans or followers, this is actually point two, sorry. Follow me. Fans versus followers. Mm. I don't know about you. I've been a Philadelphia Flyers fan since I was age seven. I loved everything about them. I got hooked on them early 70s. They had these guys, got a nickname in like 1972 called the Broad Street Bullies. Them guys on the ice, they were nasty. They, they, were, they got this nickname because it was rough play. Most of them didn't have their front teeth because they were fighting all the time. <laughs> the goalies got in fights, and they didn't get in fights with the other goalies. They got in fights with the players. That's how they, they got this nickname. You'll catch me all year round wearing one of these shirts, the Flyer shirts, because <laughs> I'm a fan of them. I like the Flyers, but I'm not wearing it today. <laughs> But uh, I saw them miss a game on TV. When they're on, I get wound up. So excited for them. A lot of my friends will tell you when I'm watching a hockey game with them that I bleed orange and black, the team colors. <laughs> but there's also times where we are watching our rival teams, like the Penguins. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I love dogging on them. They have a guy on their team called Sidney Crosby. And don't get me wrong, he's a great player, but we gave him a nickname, Crybaby. He doesn't like to be touched, and the Flyers like to hit. So I'm sorry. He goes crying the blues to every referee out there. So I even have signed memorabilia of the Flyers and stuff because I'm a fan. I'm just a huge fan of them, my favorite team. But there's only one problem with that. I am just a fan. I'm not on the team of the Flyers. The true, true followers of the Flyers are the guys on the team. They're the guys that in the off season who are training hard and in the locker room on game day, studying the game plan, going over the game book with the, with the coach, listen to the directions. They're the guys on game day who will lace up them skates and they hit the ice. I don't get to do that. They are the true followers of the flyers. It's no different than church. Come to church on a Sunday morning. 
Are we just fans sitting here of Jesus? Are we true followers? Do we really get into the word of God? Do we live that lifestyle? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Are you just know about him? Do you talk to him daily or do you admire him just on a Sunday morning? Do you put on the full armor of God? And I have this t-shirt that was given to us and I love this t-shirt. Or do you just put on the t-shirt that says that you're a Jesus fan? I want more than that. When I wear that shirt, I want everybody to know that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Do we analyze the playbooks or do we follow what other Christian followers are doing? How a person answers the follower fan question is, is how I define discipleship of Jesus Christ. Which is you? What are you? Who are you in Jesus? So we established in point one that Jesus calls and disciples follow. Point two was Jesus leads his disciples and they get up and they follow him. Step three is Jesus transforms and disciples become more like Jesus. Verse 19 says, and I will make you. Jesus transforms us to his likeness of him. Second Corinthians 517 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. He wants us to give us all to become his. So that means you have to give up your old life. It says it again in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. It says, you were taught with your regard to your former way of life to put off your old self created to be like a God in his true righteousness and in his holiness. Boy, we really struggle with this one. A lot of us can't get rid of our old lives. We come on a Sunday and we worship Jesus, but then during the week we go back to our old patterns. We truly got to give up everything for him to follow him. Jesus transforms our hearts and our minds so that we can see the lost through his eyes. He transforms us to become his hands and his feet to a lost world out there. And believe me, we live in a lost world. I mean, you look at this world right now, it's horrible. A world is so divided. And it's gonna take his disciples to stand up. And we need to pray for our world every day. Jesus transforms, and we need to obey his commands. What if Jesus meant this stuff that he said? Man, I believe every word he said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's John 14, 15. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's command and remained in his love. Jesus wants us, all of us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only those who does the work and the will of my Father in heaven. That's a tough verse. Lord, Lord. Sometimes we call, but if we're just being a Sunday goer and we're not doing what he says... Chance you're not getting in. He wants to be doers. Discipleship is, is not merely a matter of information that you remember, but it's a lifestyle that is practiced. You can know this book, the Bible, inside and out, front and back, but if you're not living it, you're not doing God's will. We could be knowers of it, but we did a message on this a while back. You can have all the head knowledge you want of the Word of God, but if you're not spreading it out to others. It's not doing a world of good. What would our church be like if we actually obeyed everything Jesus commanded? What would your life be like if you obeyed everything Jesus commanded?
Some things to think about. It. When was the last time somebody accused you of being a radical Jesus follower? At the end of the service, I asked them to play a song by the Newsboys called Jesus Freak. And I know it's a rock and roll song and we're not used to rock and roll in a church and it's part rap song, but the message behind it, are you labeled a Jesus freak? Do people, when they see you, see you as a Jesus freak or they just see you as a regular old, regular old person who lives your regular life every day? Man, I want people to know I'm a Jesus freak. Everywhere I go, I want people to know I am a Jesus freak. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and his children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. What does he mean by that? That's a harsh verse. Really harsh. To hate your father and mother and brothers and sisters. What he is saying is in this verse here that you need him first. He comes most above all in our lives. You need to put him before anything else. Then you love your father and your mother and your brothers and sisters. But foremost is to love him. We're going to read the greatest commandment. And I'd like us to read it all together. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you guys to, to read along with me. It should be up on the PowerPoint. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six 36 to 40. It's the greatest commandment. Hearing the word, or hearing that Jesus and his, and, oh wait, I'm on the wrong one. I'm reading the wrong thing. Sorry, guys. It is. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love your neighbor, or love your God, Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. There you got it. That's Jesus' commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And to love your neighbors. That's why it's important to get to know our neighbors. And our neighbors just aren't the ones that live right beside us. They could be people in all different towns. Anthony and I got talking about this morning. They're in your surrounding towns, states. They're all of our neighbors. We need to be praying for them. So we established in one that Jesus calls and disciples follow. Two, Jesus leads his disciples and they follow. Three, Jesus transforms and we become like his likeness. Step four, Jesus commissions disciples go and make more disciples last words we want our last words to count when we talk to somebody right when I leave the house I love to tell my wife I love her I want her to know that it's important that she knows that I love her I don't know if these are going to be my last words I ever say to her when Jesus left us, he left some last words too. And they're very important. Matthew 28, 19. Matthew pens some of Jesus' last words on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples to all nations. Mm. I think that's great. I used to use this saying when, I'm, when I go over and I'm working in the office with Lisa. Usually when I'm leaving, leaving the office, I usually come over here to do some work in church, but I end up going back over to do some more work in the office with her. But usually when I leave the office, I have this little saying, I'll be right back after these messages. <laughs> I say it every time I leave the office with her. But it's just let her know that I am coming back. Jesus says that in his words, I will be back. These messages, he's probably saying the same thing. I'll be right back at this message. After we deliver the word to everybody out there, he's coming back. We need to wake up and do our job. So, 
Jesus also says this a few times in there. His last words, go make disciples. He also says it um, right before he ascends. Jesus says, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will go and be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Man, those words are powerful for Jesus. That's his last words. He's telling us what he wants us to do. Go and make disciples. I don't know. I see a lot of empty seats in churches, and I've been to a bunch of different churches all around, and I see too many empty seats. I think we're failing at what we're called to do. If we're doing what we're called to do, why aren't these seats full on a Sunday morning? Why aren't we reaching those neighbors that need reached? We need to get out there. I, I want you guys to do something for me. I want you all to close your eyes and I want you to envision Jesus calling. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You can open your eyes. Have you answered this call? Have you left your old life behind to follow Jesus? Are you a true follower or just a fan? Are you allowing him to transform you into his likeness? Are you telling others your story? Because we all have a story to tell. We've all been through a lot of stuff. I love sharing my story with people. And it's helped a lot of folks out there. We all need to be sharing a story. And most importantly, are we sharing with others the gospel message? And a good way of sharing that message is by telling your story and how you got to where you are. Jesus got you through that. And you can share the word of God with them. Are you fulfilling his greatest commission and going and making disciples? Are you a follower or a fan. It's important. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you, and now these four steps you've given us just out of one powerful verse. It's amazing what you called us to do. Father, I just ask that you really get deep into our hearts, that we listen, that we become disciples that want to be out there spreading your word, not just here on a Sunday morning, worship you on a Sunday morning, but every day of the week, 24-7, we are being your disciple. Father, it's time for, for our world to wake up. It's so divided. The Christian people really need to start spreading the gospel, Father, and it starts right here with us. It starts here with me. Father, I want to be your disciple every day, I want to deny myself and pick up my cross and follow you. That's what it's all about, Father, is you. You loved us so much, Father. I just pray for your blessing over each and every one of these folks here today and those watching online. Father, I just pray that you open our hearts, our mind, our soul, that we can seek the lost. Father, use us and guide us, and we want to obey you. Transform us. Uh, we love you, and I ask that you be with each and every one today as they travel. Keep them safe. Father, we love you. And all Jesus' people said, amen. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.